I love that song. Behold. Daniel, do you like that song? That's a good one, wasn't it? I might let you sing it next Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody got me a hat. Uh, where's or Sandy Hinkley's not here? It said, uh, Pastor, beware. Whatever you say to him can be used against you in a, used in a sermon. As long as I don't give the name right, I'm good. All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 today. We're moving right along. Moving right along. I hope you're enjoying the, uh, the the Sermon on the Mount series. I'm telling you guys, it has, obviously, whoever the teacher is, it seems like they sometimes get a little more out of it than the student, but I'm loving it. You know, the Sermon on the Mount has opened my eyes to just some, every time you go through the Bible, it's like looking at a diamond. You turn it and you see different facets, right? You just see something different each time. You know, it's just amazing how God is. But we're studying in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, what we call the six, these six statements of Jesus where you have heard it said, meaning these liars, these hypocrites, these Pharisees have told you this, but they're liars, it ain't true. I'm telling you this. I'm telling you what God really said. And that's our only goal in life is to understand what God really said and what? Be doers. That should be the most important thing. What did God say? Because when you get to heaven... You're going to be accountable for what you did with what God said, right? So it's very important that, uh, as I've said all my life, you know, the, the preaching of the Word of God is a life and death conversation. I mean, this is, this is a more important conversation than sitting down with that doctor and getting the, you know, you're afraid you got cancer and you're fixing to talk to him about it. Because there's life after death. This is the only information out there. You search all over this world. And you will never find anything that's going to give you an answer for life after death, but only in this book right here. Okay, that's it. That's an absolute truth. My opinion ought to be yours, right? Not an opinion, a fact. So we're looking at these six statements. The Pharisees had said, you just don't murder. Jesus said, don't even be angry with anyone, right? The Pharisees said, don't commit adultery. Jesus said, don't even lust. The Pharisees said, you can divorce your spouse for any reason. Just give them a certificate. Jesus said, no, you don't divorce for just any reason, right? He's changed it. Jesus, he didn't change anything. What he's changing is their lie. He's correcting them, taking them back to what God actually said. He's correcting everyone on what God actually said, not what men say he said. I want to guard you guys against this. There's many different religions and denominations and all these people out there and they'll and one key thing you always listen for i know the bible says this but this is what it really means be careful about those things okay always test whoever's teaching god's word you test me whatever i say to you you test me you go and make sure what i'm telling you is right and you go to the preacher down the street and he says no i don't agree with that you should say well why don't you agree with what he said can you show me in the Bible why you disagree? If he just says, well, it just don't make sense to me, well, then you dismiss that dude and come back. But if he shows you book, chapter, verse, he explains to you in Scripture, and here's the second part of that. When he shows you in Scripture what he believes, does it contradict other Scripture? Because I promise you, when you go around, you start talking to different churches and different religions, and they say, well, I don't agree with him, and they give you a Bible passage, that passage is going to contradict other passages. I've been doing this a long time. I don't, you know, so what I'm telling you is make sure the Scripture interprets the other Scripture. Make sure it all harmonizes together because God doesn't contradict Himself ever. 66 books, right? He never contradicts Himself. And that's the test. That's how you know that the Christian Bible is the only source of authority. All the other isms out there are, are lies of Satan. And we can prove that, okay? The Bible is amazing. 1 Timothy 4.1 tells us, look on the screen, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and what? Doctrines of demons. We're seeing this big as the, the this liberal movement across our, this woke movement across our nation it's moving into the church now and they want to be considerate 
We need to be careful about using he and she because that's offensive. Did y'all see that come out on the news this week? Yeah, I mean, this stuff's just, I mean, it's Satan moving into the church. It's always been there. Well, the Pharisees, just like religious people today, they created a system that they could work with. They taught the people, this is what God meant, and as long as you just do this, then you will end up in the kingdom of heaven. So they thought they were right with God because they were doing what the Pharisees had told them. But in fact, they were not right with God. And let's look at the fifth one today, the fifth of the, you have heard it said, but I'm telling you this. Look on the screen, Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your garment also. And whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Right? So we, we got these statements of Jesus where everybody's like, oh man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And Jesus comes along and says, no you ain't. You got it all wrong. One of the hardest things, conversations to have with people, and they don't like it. We have to do it as Christians. Listen, everything you've learned, and I don't care if you're here today and you're 80 or if you're 8. Everything you've learned about God, if you didn't learn it from this Bible, we got to start you all over. Because you have learned nothing but a lie. All you have learned is doctrines of demons designed by Satan to deceive you and lie. And people say, well, I don't know if I believe in Satan. Well, why? I don't know if I believe in God. Why not? What proof do you have? There's millions of people all over the planet that believe in him. Are you saying everybody on the whole planet stupid and crazy but you? What information do you have that I don't have? I'm, I'm all ears. Show me how, how in the world all this stuff got here. I'm waiting. We know people like Darwin tried to come up and say something. Well, guess what? Nobody listens to him anymore. They've debunked that. His theories of evolution, it don't, it don't stand up. Those birds never became a cat. Right? A bird's still a bird. A cat's still a cat. A dog's still a dog. Humans are still humans. So we can go on and on with the things, that, the apologetics. I tell you guys little things all the time. But back to the main point of Jesus correcting us. Jesus comes and says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, they had actually heard that. That was in the Bible. And I think we should look, as I did last couple of weeks, I want to show you how the Pharisees have changed God's word. So, to be able to see how they've changed it and twisted these people up, we need to go back and see what did God say, right? So, there's your standard. There's your barometer. There's where you go to make sure that people understand what did God say? And he said this in three different passages. Jesus, where he's quoting from, is in the Old Testament, and it's in three different passages in the Old Testament. All right? So look on the screen with me. Uh, this one's a few verses we're going to look at, and then the next one I'll just use one or two verses. But Exodus 21, 12. And I want you to follow the flow of this because you'll see how God, how God is showing us his intentions on dealing with injustices. All right? Somebody, crime. Things that, that have happened in the uh, community that are wrong. People have been harmed. Things have you know, have happened that shouldn't have happened. Somebody violated someone. And, and God is showing us here how he intended to deal with those matters, okay, with his children. He said, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But if he did not lie and wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint you a place to which he may flee. If, however, a man acts presumptuously toward his neighbor so as to kill him by deceit, you shall take him even from my altar that he may die. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his hand, shall, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And if men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and he does not die but remains in bed, if he gets up and walks around outside on his staff, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. Now guys, you men, 
don't, don't read into this and take the wrong thing away today, right? You can't just give him a little slug as long as he can get up two days later, he's okay. All right, so, but hang on, this is what their rules were. He shall only pay for his loss of time, and he shall take care of him until he is completely healed. Woo, you don't like that part. And if a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod, and he dies at his hand, he shall surely be punished. But if for a day or two he is able to stand, no punishment shall be taken, for he is his property. And if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband will set for him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. Underline that if you're taking notes. Underline that in your Bible. That's the key to this whole thing. He shall pay as the judges decide. I'm going to slow down. you got to get that. You'll miss this whole passage today if you don't get those few words right there. As the judges decide. And what are the judges? Verse 23. But if there's any further injury, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, Bruise for bruise, wound for wound. And then in Leviticus 24, 19, If a man injures his neighbor just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. And then the last one, Deuteronomy 19, 21, Thus your eye shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So Jesus in these statements is taking us back to the heart of the law, the intent of the law, right? Why did God write the law this way? What did God want from his people when he gave them these instructions? And in a nutshell, you know what he wanted? Justice. Law and order. Right? I love when our president a few years ago came out, you know, the, the past president, and he said, we're going to have law and order in this country. You know why he said that? Because that's what God ordained. He wants justice, and he wants law and order. And that's what he is showing these people. This is how we're going to have it. God wanted the punishment to equal the crime. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, right? Which, as we saw that, that was God's intention. The goal, of course, obviously, just as it is today, was to deter future crime. That's what the purpose of the government is, right? To punish evildoers. Not to coddle them, it's to punish them. Why? So they don't keep doing crime. And it spreads the word around the village and around the state and the country that we don't tolerate crime. We've changed in America on that, haven't we? And now look what we got. We got a dadgum mess. We got kids that don't even fear the, the law or consequences at all. So, God's plan was to deter crime. Now, in this plan, this judicial system that God creates is no different than today. There had to be witnesses. Deuteronomy 19.15 said, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. You go and tell a judge or someone that, uh, that hey, th this person did this, they did that to me, and the judge goes and asks them, Did you do that? And they say, No, I didn't. Well, what's the judge supposed to do? Just take your word for it? See, it's the problem we got now. We even see this in the church. Come to the pastor and say, well, so-and-so did this to me. Well, do you have a witness? Well, no, but I'm telling you they did it. Well, what do you want me to do? First of all, let me be clear to the church here. And all you listening out there, I am not a judge in Cheatham County. I'm not a police officer. I'm a volunteer. I'm a pastor. I don't have any authority over any of you. You come to me and say, my husband's been mean, I'm not going to come and handcuff him and take him to jail. I don't have that authority. Now, am I going to talk to him? Yes. Have you been mean to your wife? And he says, no, man, I haven't been mean to my wife. And we begin to pry. Well, I'm not just going to take your word for it and go and cast him out in the street. And I'm not going to do the same. That's not what God is talking about here, right? It's not a, a one person's word for it. What is the judge supposed to do? Well, if that were the system, if that were the system today that God had created and the system we have in our country where all it took is one person to come up and make an accusation against somebody, 
Can you see how things would get out of hand real quick? You know, I don't, Mark, I don't like the way you looked at me. So you know what? Mark did this. Well, Mark's gone. Put him in prison. Well, guess what? Jack may say that about me tomorrow. And there goes Derek. Terry, I mean, you know you're gone. You ever get upset? Listen to this. You ever get upset because your rights got violated by someone? Or you didn't get what you thought you should have got? You, were tre you weren't treated the way you thought you should have been treated. You were disrespected. What did you want in that moment? Some of you are like, hmm, boy, you're not looking at me, right? Because you're like, boy, it's too fresh. Too fresh on my mind. If you didn't get treated right. Things didn't go your way. What is your first reaction? Is it equal punishment? No, not generally. I always like to think of riding down the road. Y'all don't, don't deal with road rage. I know none of y'all do. But generally what happens when somebody does something crazy to you on the road, you want to get up beside them, don't you? Do that. Remember the little Kermit the Frog picture? Have y'all seen him over? He's, you want to stare them down, right? You want to get them. And it ain't just that. That's a funny one. But we go above and beyond when it comes to punishment, okay? Well, vengeance. That's what we want. We've been disrespected. I want payback. I want to teach them a lesson. I want them to apologize. I want to correct their bad behavior, right? I want to right or wrong. Ultimately, if we're being honest, we just want what we want out of this, right? That's what we want because we're mad, we're hurt, we're angry, you know, we're upset. Well, God knows your heart. God knew the heart of man. And what is in the heart of man? To put self first. That's what we do. Our hearts are wicked. Jeremiah tells us. The heart is desperately wicked, right? Who can understand? I want you to know, guys, when it comes to this judging one person's testimony versus another and all this stuff, I have been a part of well over 100, probably closer to 200 murder scenes. Any of you here ever been on a murder scene? Some of you have served, yeah, law enforcement. I've been on probably close. I worked in Nashville, so I saw a lot of murders, a lot of homicides. They didn't always die, but I've seen a lot of bad stuff. Okay, I've been probably over a thousand domestic violence calls. Some people, you know, when you talk to me, you'll find out I know the law. And I understand psychology, right? And I've talked to a lot of psychiatrists and a lot of doctors and a lot of people over the years. And I may sound like a little country redneck, and that's fine, because I like to be a simple guy. But, I, but I've been there and seen stuff. I know what I'm talking about in these areas. Now, I don't say that to be haughty and prideful, but what I'm telling you is I've learned firsthand through what, looking at child abuse cases and sex abuse cases and rapes and murders and all of these things, and you're there talking to people in the heat of the moment, and you hear their testimonies, and then you get to court, and you hear how they twist it all up, change things, right? You talk to a woman, this man's tried to kill me tonight, and then three weeks later, you're sitting at a preliminary hearing, and they're sitting there all hugged up to each other, and she's, well, I didn't really mean it like that. I mean, it didn't really happen that way. And here I am almost, you know, fighting for my life with a guy over something, and there they are all hooked up with each other. Testimonies change. Eyewitness account is one of the worst evidences. You can ask any district attorney that you know, and they'll tell you, eyewitness account is one of the worst types of evidence you can use. Because people change. They forget things, and they twist up their story. And all it takes is a smooth little lawyer to get on the stand up there and make you doubt what you originally saw or what you originally said and they twist people up. That's the whole point of the whole court system, right? So getting to the truth is very difficult sometimes. What did God want? The whole point of this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth law that we're talking about here is that God did not want people to take matters into their own hands. If you don't hear anything else I say today, whenever something bad happens to you, do not take matters into your own hands because your heart is wicked and you're angry and you're not going to make the right choice. I advise you, as Proverbs tells, seek godly counsel. When you get upset, seek godly counsel. What? Call your pastors and elders, right? Call your brothers and sisters in Christ. Run it by them. What would you do? What should I do? And if they're not giving you biblical counsel, then stay away from them. Give people biblical counsel. Don't just tell them what they want to hear so you keep a friend. Give them godly counsel. What did God want? What's the point of this whole system? People wouldn't take matters in their own hand. He created a system of judges to examine each case. The courts and judges needed witnesses, evidence. They were not just to take one person's word 
on a matter. You know, God created this. God created the government. Look on the screen, Romans 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now remember, you're Christians. Your life is not your own anymore. You've been changed. You've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. You're not here wrestling against flesh and blood. You are here to be a witness for Jesus Christ and to suffer persecution for it. So when you hear that right there, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, what does your flesh say? Uh-uh-uh. Not me. Because I don't like the governing authorities. How many of you love when the police officer is sitting on the side of the road when you go into town? We can't stand it. Right? It's just like the two-year-old at home when you put the cookie jar where he can't get it. He don't like that. He wants his cookie. Don't restrain me. Let me have all I want, right? That's our flesh. So, we are to be in subjection, God said, to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God. God created the government. And those which exist have been appointed by God. You ain't the first Christian to deal with a wicked leader. It's been happening for a long time all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar and even before that the children of Israel they had wicked kings remember from, from, from Rehoboam in the beginning all the way down to you know when you look at the southern kingdom to Jeconiah and all them wicked kings right that's what God's people got why because of their rebellion because of their behavior I'm convinced and y'all can disagree with me on this because this is not biblical it's just a dare I'm convinced that the United States of America you know, we were blessed in the beginning. Those Puritans come over here and we and established this country that was free from, from the state telling us what kind of church we got to go to. We could worship the God of the Bible freely. God blessed this land. And now you guess where, where your Christians are at? They're going to the ball games. They just like Judah and Israel, they turned from worshiping the true God to chasing after their idols, their fun and their entertainment. And that's why we're dealing with what we're dealing with in this country. You can disagree with me on that all you want, but that's my opinion. God said here that, therefore, whoever resists that authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. We are to be a submissive people. We are to obey the government. Okay? I don't agree with the pastors who come up uh, three years ago and said, we need to, or eight, seven years, we need to open the border and let all these people fly in here. I believe in protecting the poor and are in this world, of course. But God said, obey the law. In America, we have a law, immigration law. And those people coming in need to obey the law. They don't just open up the border and let all the sex traffickers and drug traffickers and criminals they've released from other countries just flow in our southern border. That ain't biblical. That's not Christian-like. And I know I'm going to get some heat over that, but I'm telling you what I'm telling you the truth. We are to submit to the, to the governing authorities in our country as law and order. That's what God intended, that there be law and order and justice. For, and that's what we're supposed to be striving for. God did not want man to take matters into his own hands. God made sure the punishment was handled by the authorities. And the punishment would equal the crime, not greater than the crime. This is what an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth meant. That the courts would mete out the punishment, not you. So when something's done wrong to you, you go to the authorities. You don't take matters into your own hands. That's not what the people in Jesus' kingdom will do, okay? Sinful man does not want the punishment to be equal to the crime. They want far more. Now, the Pharisees, what have they done? They've come along and they've changed things, okay? They said things like, hey, you hate your neighbor, but as long as you don't murder him, you can still go to heaven. Hey, you lust after that man or woman, but as long as you don't act on it, then you can still go to heaven. Hey, you don't like your spouse anymore? They did something that upset you? They don't treat you right? Well, just give them a certificate of divorce and move on. That's what the Pharisees had said. Don't worry about your promises. Just don't swear by God. As long as you don't bring God's name into it, you can break your promises. That's what they said. Someone did you wrong? Eye for an eye, buddy. Get your pound of flesh. You show them. You got to protect yourself. You got to take matters into your own hands. Because the government don't care. See, that's what they've started twisting things to do. Why? Because they could handle that. What they couldn't handle 
is what Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, 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 no. All of that is wrong. The law was meant for the courts and the judges to deal with and administer punishment, not you. Let me show you, Jesus is saying here now, the guy, hey, strap on because this is fixing to hurt. Y'all ready? Got your steel toes on? Before I get into this, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you want to please your Savior who carried you across to Calvary? And listen to this with a heart that says, Lord, correct me if I'm wrong. Teach me. Be teachable. Be changeable people. Don't be hard-hearted. Set your ways. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what they think. Don't be like that. That's not what God's people are like. God's people are humble, right? They want to be changed. They want to be corrected. Jesus corrects them. He says, let me show you how my people handle this eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, right? They're going to use the court system. But when other people come at you with other things, it's going to hurt you because I promise you, people are going to hurt you in your life. They're going to disappoint you. They're going to disrespect you, mistreat you. Come. There's no way around it. What do you do when that happens? Jesus says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And most of you today are like, I got so many shirts and coats and stuff, they can have all, I, I can give them a hundred and not even feel a dent in it, but it wasn't like that in that time. A man might have three, two or three of these nice undershirts, right? They were long t-shirts that went all the way down, okay? They didn't wear blue jeans, skinny jeans. That's, that's sinful. That's unbiblical. I worked it in there, yeah. So you ladies come to me sometime. I can work stuff in there, you know, help you out a little bit. You don't want your husband wearing skinny jeans, do you? Well, they had these long shirts, and he might only have one if he's poor. He might have three. So the idea that this man has done something wrong, okay, he clearly did something wrong. He's got to go to court. You don't want to take everything the man's got to, 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 bring, to make the point, okay? But Jesus is saying, yeah, you're in the wrong, but I don't want you to go in there and really and try to defend your rights, give a bunch of excuses. Well, here's why I did it and all that. And he said, just go in there and say, look, man, you not only you, you want my shirt, okay, you can have it, but you can have my coat too. Right? He want I just want to do anything that I can to make things right with you. I want you to know I'm sorry that I did you wrong. I am so sorry that I did wrong, and I want to make things right. Take whatever you you need to take to, so that you we and you can be even again. That's the heart of a Christian. Take it all. I don't care. You can have it. Jesus says, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. The Jewish, we won't understand that, but in the Jewish time, do y'all remember when Jesus was being carried to the cross and they pulled out Simon of Cyrene because he could, because Jesus couldn't carry the cross anymore? They beat him so bad, he's physically exhausted. He couldn't carry that cross, so they grabbed this big strong man and said, hey, you carry the cross for him. You know why they did that? That was a common practice for the Romans. They used to have Roman. They used to have people, the Roman soldiers or, or Roman couriers, like we have today, mail couriers. It would be transporting stuff all over the world, right, all over the place. And they, if they got tired or got sick, something happened to them, they could pull a citizen out and say, "Hey, finish my journey." And that was a common practice in the Roman government. They could just grab you and say, "You know, Nick, hey, take this and finish." And Nick's like, "Man, I got a job to do. I got a family. It don't matter. Get on the horse and go deliver the mail." And, and, but they only had to go so far. And it was generally just like to the outskirts of town or somewhere, you know, so you could get back in a reasonable time. So instead of inconveniencing Nick, saying, man, I need you to run to Nashville, Nick's like, That's, man, I got ball practice, I got a game, I, I ain't got time. But, and Nick would say, no, you know what, I'm not only will I go to Nashville, buddy, I'll go to the Alabama line for you. I'm going to show you that I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own. See, this is the heart of what Jesus did to do. Somebody wants something from you, you don't just give them that, give them more. Meet their needs. See what they need. Why? Because you're not worried about your own needs. You're more worried about theirs. In verse 42, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, I thought one of the best passages, let the Bible speak for itself. When we look at these things about giving beyond what we're asked for, you know, letting people know I care more about you than my own self. Romans 12, 9, look on the screen. It's one of the greatest passages to help us understand how to deal with with things when people are treating us wrong or disrespecting us or doing something that we don't like it's making us mad. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. By abhorring what is evil, clinging to what is good, being devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor, 
not lagging behind in diligence, being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in affliction, being devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, pursuing hospitality. Bless those who pers persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, as you go down that list we just read, how many of you was checking every one of them off? I got it. I'm good at that. I'm good at that. What's your checklist look like on that one? Y'all go back this afternoon and look at, pull up that passage. See how well you're doing. Okay? You should have been able to check every one of them. Now watch this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. That should hit us. Terry sent me the news the other night of that young lady that, that, that passed so tragically. Des and I were sitting at the table fixing to eat. And I'm fixing to say the blessing for our meal. And I couldn't say it. I'm telling my church family this. Not because this is what it means to weep with those who weep. Right? I met her two times. But I had a compassion over her. She's struggled with drugs and alcohol so long. Lost her children over it, right? But now here she is, four years sober. You know, trying to get getting a job. Trying to get her kids, you know, trying to make things right. And she, she just failed. Like any of us fall, right? And I couldn't pray. Because I'm just about to weep for this young lady, for Ashley. I just wanted to just, man, I wanted so much for her. I wanted to see a victory there, right? But God had other plans. Well, guess what we're going to be praying now? God, take her four children and use them for her to honor their mother. Let them don't go down that path. There's two of them that's on that path. Two of them's doing good, two of them ain't. And I want the church to pray. I bring up the little stories like that so y'all can understand. We need to weep with those who weep. Right? My brother Wade, you know, saying goodbye to his mother. That's hard. That's hard. I ain't been there yet. You know, and I hurt for him and Carol. You know, I mean, they love their mother, right? I mean, how do you know that if you, don't, if you don't know what people are going through? How do you weep with those who weep? How about rejoicing? Some of you gave praise. Charlene, that made me so happy to hear you say, I don't have a heart issue. Because I guarantee your daughter needs her right now, you know? What a blessing. Can you rejoice with her today over that? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. By being of the same mind toward one another. Here it is. Not being haughty in mind, but associating with the humble. Do not be wise in your own mind, never paying back evil for evil to anyone. Respecting what is good in the sight of all men, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I don't care what they've said to you or done to you. You work as unto the Lord. Well, they're running over me. They're taking advantage. They're being, I don't care. You do it for the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. You don't get your pound of flesh. You don't go in there and try to fix people and change people and demand they act a certain way too, and then you'll love them. What if Jesus did that to you? We, none of us would be in here. So don't turn around and do that to other people. Remember the parable of the, of the wicked slave? That where the man, the slave owner, forgave him of all of his debt? Didn't he make him pay a penny of his debt? What did that man do? He turned around and went to the man who owed him money and strangled him to death to get his money back. Don't be like that wicked slave. Don't pay back evil for, for evil to anyone. Right? But never taking your own revenge, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Do you think you've got a God, a Father in heaven, who's, not, who, who's unsympathetic to what you're going through? Trust me. He knows what you're dealing with. And He'll deal with those. The Bible tells us, remember all these, these yahoos over here wanting to destroy Israel? That's the apple of his eye. What do you think he's fixing to do to them? Go read the Bible. Don't mess with Israel. That's his people. And they ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till, wait till Russia and Iran and all them get together and come upon Israel and they whip them. The Bible tells you what's coming. Y'all don't know what all is in here. I'm telling you, it's the coolest thing you've ever looked at in your whole life. I can sit here and tell you all this stuff is coming because the Bible tells me so. But God said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Here's your job. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. 
For in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Proverbs 25, 21 says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head. And Yahweh will repay you. Resist the evil person. Don't give in to your flesh. Don't try to get your pound of flesh. Don't try to get even. Don't go through all of that. Trust that God will protect you. And God will take care of all those people that, that cause you harm. The point is, in this temporary vapor of a life, you are going to be mistreated. People will not respect you. And they will treat you cruelly. But you are not to take matters into your own hands. Look to Jesus as the example. Did they lie about Jesus? Created that mock trial, right? They lied about him. Was he mistreated? Can you imagine, men? look at that big old beautiful beard old Bailey's got this morning. Isn't that nice there? Can you imagine them pulling every single one of the hairs out of his face? Jesus was mistreated. And what did Jesus do? After the crown of thorns shoved down on his head, his back beaten open where they could see his insides, drove the nails through his hands and feet, plucked his beard, spit on him, mocked him, come down off of that cross if you're the son of God, right? What did Jesus do? Boy, I'm going to wait. You just wait. I'm fixing to show y'all. Is that what he said? Let me remind you something. And Chad, you'll remember this. It was something when, uh, when they went to arrest Jesus a few nights before that. Remember that? Cohort. Roman cohort come to arrest him. You know what a cohort is? 600. They sent the Roman army. Some of you guys been in the military. You think one man could resist 600 army men coming in there, Roman soldiers? And the Jewish police, temple police, all coming to arrest him. You know why they sent so many? They thought there was going to be an uprising, see? So they, they were going to squelch that right tonight. We're going to end this tonight. And they come up there and Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek and and they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And what happened? A cohort of men fell down on the ground. Don't tell, Jesus could have come off of the cross and wiped out everybody on the planet like God did in the flood. But he didn't. You know what he said? Father, forgive them. Stephen laid down there. They're pounding that sweet young man, that humble man, Stephen, pounding him with those big rocks. And he cried out. And he's not Jesus. He's just a man like us. And he said, what? Father, forgive him. Right? That's the example. Right? And when you do that, when you don't retaliate like the world does, people don't know what to do with that. They're expecting you to do what they would do. To get even. Get their pound of play. I'm going to pay you back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you a lesson. Mess with me. Right? That's what they do. Well, guess what? When you don't do what they're expecting you to do, it, those, it's burning in their conscience. And here's what they're saying. Why would that person not pay me back? Why would they treat me kindly when I did them wrong? Why would they be so loving when I have been so cruel to them? I've ignored my wife and been rude to her, and I didn't value her, and I didn't protect her, and she treats me like I'm Jesus. Why would she do that? I can't understand why she would treat me so good when I've treated her so bad. How about I've disrespected my husband. I've ignored him. I've been vindictive to him. But he just keeps showing me grace and patience. Why? Folks to the world, unsaved people, people who will not be in heaven, they're going to hear these words and they're going to say to me, the heck with that, that's crazy. I'm not going to let people run over me, right? I'm not going to let them take advantage of me. I'm not going to let someone do that to me. I'll show them. I'll show them an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I'll get my vengeance. They won't mess with me again. But the people in Jesus' kingdom, you know what they do? They die to self. What did Jesus say? If any man would come after me, he must what? Die to self. Take up the cross and follow me. You cannot be with Jesus Christ until you die to self. That's the gospel. That's the absolute truth. You've got to get out off of your throne, your kingdom that you're trying to create on this planet that's going to be burned up one day. You've got to get off of it and say, Jesus, you're on the throne 
and I'm kneeling down at the foot of your throne waiting for you to tell me what to do. Because it ain't about me anymore. I will suffer for you. I will forgive people who hurt me and I will love my enemies and I'll pray for those who persecute me. Why? Because I'm more concerned about their soul. I'm more concerned about where they're going than what I gain here. All of this stuff that I gain here will be burned up. If I have to sacrifice some time or some money or some resources or possessions, if I have to sacrifice the things that I've worked so hard for, in order to win someone to Jesus Christ, I'll do it, Lord. I'll die to self. Because the treasures of this life, remember what Paul said? I consider it all as what? Manure. Dung. A waste. Now the Bible's not teaching us, guys, here in closing, that we should just Just give everything we got away. Right? Because what happens if you just gave it all away today? Then you got no food to eat. Does the Bible tell you that you're to provide for your family? Right. So now you can't provide for your family. You gave it all away. The Bible's not teaching communism here. Right? Where you just give everything up and live poor. And live poor. We're told to be good managers of what God's given us. Right? To manage our money and our time and our resources and all that stuff. What God's digging at here that I want you to leave with today is in the core of your heart. And I thought the best example is what I used months ago. If this country collapsed and your dollar tomorrow is worth a penny, that could happen, as the experts say, very realistically, right? The value of the dollar crashes. You, you're pretty comfortable with your 401ks and your, and your retirements and your bank accounts, and you're like, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. But tomorrow morning you wake up and it's, it's a penny on the dollar. What's your first thought? Are you mad? You want to fight? Get even? Go kill people? Or does it say, Lord, I guess we're going the poor route. See, what are you clinging to? And if you've died to self, if you've died to this world, and you're only living for the kingdom of God, that's what His people do. They're not out for vengeance. They're not out to teach people lessons and to, and to store up treasures on earth. They're what? They're just witnesses for Jesus Christ. And we're called to suffer. Right? Father, none of this is possible without you. We can't do it. Every person in this room and every person that's listening to me right now can honestly say, God, I can't do that apart from you. We need your grace to help us to do these things. Lord, we look around just in this little room right here, a little dot on this planet. And everybody in here would tell you, Lord, we're blessed. We're blessed. You have provided for us over and over and over. We don't miss meals in here. I, and if there's someone here that's missing a meal, I hope they'll let me know. Because you won't miss another one. But Lord, you have blessed us over and over and over. So you've proven to us, God, that you will provide for us. That we don't have to worry about the future. We don't have to worry about anything. We just need to be good stewards, good managers of what you've given us. And Lord, if somebody needs something from us, let them have it. We'll let them have it. We're not going to take advantage of people. We're not going to only protect ourselves, as we'll learn next week. We're not just going to love those who love us. Lord, we want to be your people. We want to do what you want us to do. We don't want an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. We want you to handle those things. You handle the punishment. We'll deal with the love. We'll deal with the forgiveness. We'll deal with the humility. And we'll deal with preaching your God. Help us to do that, Father. And if there's one here today, and they know right now, I'm not saved. I know I'm not saved. I have lived for self my whole life. And all it's got me is nothing but pain and heart. I need freedom. I need peace. I need joy. And I need hope. I pray, Father, right now, whoever, if they're here today, if they're listening, that they will understand clearly that is only possible by confessing Jesus is Lord. Believing in their heart that God raised him from the dead. 
And I pray today would be the day that they make a bold statement, say, I, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and never look back. I pray that for someone here today. I pray you'd give them the courage to do that by your grace. Father, for those of us who've been awful selfish, we've wanted our rights, we've been ugly, selfish, vindictive, we've dodged the church, our own family, whatever it is, Father, I pray that you would break their hard heart and remind them they're not God. They're just as sinful as the rest of us. and They need to humbly forgive and love and move on. Whatever the need is, Father, I pray that by your Spirit you'd convict us, correct us, and lead us into uh, walking better with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name.